Mm -hmm. Bam. Here we are. The big screen. Are we live? I think we're live. Hey, we should check and see if everyone can hear us or not. Sometimes that, uh, of course, Jamie's doing it, so it probably works. When I'm doing it, it usually ends up having some kind of a... <laughs> Issue. Yay, Athena, thank you for letting us know. <laughs> Welcome to World Builders Weekly. My name's Gray. I'm the executive director of World Builders. And I'm Zay, the director of operations at World Builders. Hello, everybody. <laughs> we uh, are here as usual on Tuesday with uh, all kinds of latest news from the world of geeks doing good. Uh, some special deals at the marketplace, trivia. Uh, this is actually, we just finished the biggest trivia contest ever um, in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And by ever, I mean, it's really big, probably other ones, but, um, and we also are here to welcome, because we're so lucky to have Martha Wells with us. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. We are all excited to talk to you about things. Uh, especially your upcoming book, which launches in a week, Fugitive Telemetry. Um, but first, yay, look at that. Um, uh, but first, we have some big news that literally just fit finalized today. You may notice the nice little poster back there on the wall. World Builders is now officially a sponsor of Fiacon. Uh, which is coming up. I actually can't remember exactly what the date is. There it is, September 16th through 19th. And we will have um, we will have our own breakout room and programming uh, in their tea house kind of thing. So uh, we are very excited about this, and we're putting together our own plans for programming. But if you have ideas of what you would like to see, please do let us know and uh, we, will, we will see what we can do. With that kind of lead up, we probably can make some really cool stuff happen. Um, and yeah. That's, that's announcements. <laughs> Breaking out into trivia though. Um, last week we had a Iron Man question. I like uh, the Avengers, so this is a cool question, but what was the fake name, or what fake name does Black Widow give to Tony Stark in Iron Man 2? So this is last week's. Hopefully some of you guessed it right. The correct answer is Natalie Rushman. Is that right? Is this the correct answer? Uh, that would be that would that would be the answer, yeah. Actually, that is that is one of my favorite scenes because uh Black Widow, it was the start of her um her portrayal in the the Avengers movies, which I think is good. And then of course, <laughs> this actually relates to something I'm talking about later on, Martha, is that like in the movie, she jumps out on Captain America's motorcycle and you know picks up his shield and gives it to people. And when they released the toys, they did not have her on the motorcycle. They had, I think it was Captain America on the motorcycle or something like that. Yeah, well, to <laughs> deliberately take it out of the movie. So um, I am, I am happy that she is finally getting her own movie, and uh, maybe we can correct some of the wrongs that have been done to that character. I might have opinions on it. I'll <laughs> shut up now. <laughs> For the new trivia question, Gray, do you want to read it or you want me to steal it? <laughs> uh, you steal it. <laughs> okay. All right. If you got that last one right, you'll be entered into our monthly draw. As for the new one, you guys know the drill. Do not put it in the chat and DM any of our social media platforms, including questions at worldbuilders.org. So for next, for this week's trivia question, it's a trap. Our favorite Star Wars Admiral, Admiral Ockwater, <laughs> belongs to what alien race? So uh, yeah, Star Wars fans, hopefully you will delight and participate. Um, I think our biggest uh, responses come from these kind of big old blockbuster films. So when we get like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, um, we get our biggest pool of people and we love to have y'all. So uh, yeah, answer the questions, be entered into our monthly uh, trivia draw. Maybe you'll win something. I, I want to see a, a, a board game, uh, you know, which is which has admirals from the Star Wars universe versus admirals from the Star Trek universe. I can <laughs> see whose strategy would do which. That would be interesting. But now that we're done with our, our, uh, our housekeeping here, um, <laughs> the Zygons from Doctor Who is a shapeshift. <laughs> 
Um, we uh, like to, we're so happy to have Martha back on the uh, the whole I'm going to say podcast because we do have a podcast now, uh, but we're happy to have you here on our Twitch stream. Um, and I'm going to quick read the biography for those few people that were off in the Mars mission isolation test chamber and don't actually know who you are. Um, Martha Wells has been a science fiction and fantasy writer since her first fantasy novel was published in 1993. And her work includes the books of the Rexura series, the death of the necromancer, the fall of, and apology if I pronounce this wrong, Eldrian trilogy, the Murderbot Diaries series, okay. media tie-ins for Star Wars, Stargate Atlantis, and Magic the Gathering, as well as short fiction, young adult novels, and nonfiction. Take it, say. You can finish off the bio. <laughs> she has won a Nebula Award, two Hugo Awards, two Locus Awards, and her work has appeared on the Philip K. Dick Award Ballot, the BSFA Award Ballot, and USA Today Bestseller List, and the New York Times Bestseller List. Her books have been published in 18 languages. Welcome, Martha Wells. What an honor. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> um, and isn't this the, the, like the second pandemic release you've had? Like did you, you had one early in the pandemic and now late? Yeah, I had Network Effect came out in May of last year. And it was kind of terrifying because people really didn't know how books were gonna do. Uh, John Scalzi um, had his, I think it was The Last Emperor Ox, just I think maybe two weeks before mine came out. And um, so actually a lot of publishers I think were watching how our books did to see if they could gauge what this was gonna be like. Um, and I know a lot of publishers had to, particularly my publisher had to move some books to later in the year and postpone releases literally because they couldn't get the paper to do the printing. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's like just places, you know, factories shutting down because of COVID not being able to, um, um, get enough people to come in or worried about people infecting each other and safety, you know, safety reasons and printing was one of those. So yeah, it was an interesting time. <laughs> yeah. I think during the pandemic, we had quite a few authors that we asked like, what's your experience? But I don't think lack of access to materials is a topic like that ever came up and that's super crazy to think about. Yeah, I guess I just know about it because my editor talked to me about it. We uh, emailed, that was kind of the first, because it's still at that point, you know, I think a lot of people are sort of partially in denial or really not really understanding what was, this was going to be like, how bad this was going to be. And he emailed me and said, well, your book is coming out at the right time at the, at the same, on the same date but you'll see that we have moved other things and this is because this is why we're moving things. Um, and it was just like <gasps> paper, the printing <laughs> factory and then, and they all kinds of stuff, a whole supply chain of, you know, the trucks that move ship things to the stores. And then the stores were trying to do mail order and some of them I know weren't set up for it. And so it was just a lot of worries, but so it was kind of a huge relief when it got on the New York times bestseller list which for like 99% of my career is not something I would have ever have even worried about that there would be even the slimmest possibility I would have a book get on the New York Times bestseller list. But this one, you know, it was, it was um, really supposed to be, it was probably going to be my biggest book release of my career up to this point. Um, so yeah, it was really, it was some, some, I was, I uh, had some very stressful times waiting to see what was going to happen, you know, afraid something would happen and, you know, things would fall through and the book wouldn't be able to be released. Um, yeah, so it was just a very interesting experience. Well, uh, How is that I mean, comparing to, go, sorry, Gray. Go ahead, Zay. How is that comparing now to this one? How are you feeling leading up to the next book that's coming out? Um, I think I'm, it's, it's not nearly as nerve wracking because um, I think one thing we've seen is that people still want books. A lot of people felt like they, you know, felt like they didn't have the concentration to read. It was like the stress takes people, you know, everybody's an individual and the stress takes people in different ways. Um, I was still able to read for the first, um, 
for most of the pandemic, but I couldn't, um, I couldn't write for six months. I just didn't have the concentration. Everything I tried to do would just fall apart. Um, I'm glad I finally got over that around midsummer. Um, but then so many people were turning to books for comfort and, and solace the way, you know, you usually do. And so I don't think it disrupted, um, the publishing industry is nearly as much as as people were afraid that it was going to. Yeah, I think that people might have, you know, in some ways they they started reading more because they, you know, stay at home more, and you can only do so much. Well, some most people can only I would say most some people can only do so much uh, Netflix uh, in addition <laughs> to their Zoom watching. But yeah, um, uh, by the way. Uh, we did have uh, at least one person who said, oh, yeah, it's the lady who wrote the bee fantasy novel. So you're, uh, uh, someone read Cloud Roads way back when and loved it, the curtain shot. Oh, so, the bee, yeah, the yes. line ant people. <laughs> line yes. ant bee lizard people is what we're talking about. So, yeah. You have so, to put the other parts on or it's not going to make sense. Gotcha. Line ant, <laughs> line ant lizard, oh, my. lizard dragon, shapeshifter people. We, um, for, for this book, uh, I'm going to read what, how Liz Bork from Locus Mag described it. Um, Fugitive Telemetry is an interesting hybrid of murder mystery and space adventure. From the beginning of her career, uh, Martha Wells' characters have been relatable, understandable, complex, and human. Her world building, deft and interesting, filled with graceful detail and implying a universe beyond the page. And of course, I'm saying that right before I say, you could pre-order this right now at our World Builders Market. Um, but uh, in general, I mean, that I, I would agree with that, everything that that, uh, that person has said. Um, and how does it make you feel to have your, your work described like that? I mean, that's that's some pretty high praise. Uh, it's, it's really, really nice. <laughs> uh, um, Again, I was not, I've been, my first big book came out in 1993 and I've been doing this a long time and I've never got uh, nearly as much attention for anything as I have for Murderbot. It's been, it kind of took off from the beginning and it's been kind of getting more and more popular. Um, and I'm sort of shocked by it and surprised and grateful and also sort of like not quite understanding what's happening <laughs> so it's just like it's just um i've had a lot of experience as a writer but being popular is kind of is really new for me so um uh, uh and it's been it's been interesting to be to kind of live this wall basically unable to go to do events and conventions and everything because it's a weird sort of um I know this is happening, but in some ways it feels like it's just, you know, it's just pretend. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been, it's been really strange. We talked a little bit before when we came on about how, you know, you've definitely had during the pandemic more access to like different showings and panels and stuff. Do you though feel like you get more interaction from your fan base um, in the game popularity? Um, I think I do. I um, I definitely before last uh, in 2019 when I was still able to go to conventions, um, you know, I, I it seemed like there was tons more people showing up for my events um, and uh, people coming up and wanting to talk to me and, and that. And um, that's a lot of fun, I think, in person. Um, one of the problems with doing you know, there's a lot of cool online conventions and online event, online events and stuff. But the thing with authors that you miss out on is the interaction before and afterwards. It's like there's no sitting around talking to people. People can't come up and ask you individual questions as easily. You know, you don't get to go out to dinner, <laughs> you know, with your friends, and and you kind of don't get the, um, um, you know, the whole experience. I did a couple of book festivals this month. Uh, I think it was the Phoenix Book Festival and the San Antonio Book Festival and just on doing an online panel. And they were fun panels. And it's, um, and you get to see people you know, but then it's sort of like, that's it. You have to get off a video. And we're also talking about how, um, you know, it's like, I really hate looking at my face on the video. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't see it. 
it's just like I feel like um, having murder bot moments of like my face moved. Did, what did that mean? Did it do something? Um, I hope it's in vain. I don't vaguely mean it to convey because you just I, see yourself so closely. I would rather do an event, a live event in a room with 2,000 people than, you know, video because it's like 2,000 people aren't going to be like right here up in my face. Um, and, and it's like, but it, but, um, like I was saying before, I think that we, I did enjoy the online events of the past year because like the first one, I think one of the first ones I did was with the double clicks. Um, and we just had a good time. And at that point, it was so nice to see kind of new people. <laughs> and cause we had, I talked, I think a little bit, just a little bit in email and maybe on Twitter, but we hadn't met in person or anything. So it was like, we're meeting new people. It's so neat in my house, which I haven't been out of for, for this for this month or whatever. Um, and so those, you know, and the, it's been a lot of fun, but um, um, yeah, it's just, it's a very different experience. And yeah, like I said, it did let me be able to go to more places like when my physical book tour, tour was canceled, but tour.com arranged a online book tour and I was able to do things like do a bookstore in St. Louis or in a talk in New York and then turn around and do a talk, um, you know, for a local bookstore, you know, all online in a way that I would never, you would never be able to do that, you know, in the physical world. So it had a lot of advantages, but uh, yeah. I miss, miss interacting with other humans in a non like, um, laptop environment <laughs> yeah yeah i i feel the same way about i feel like we're, we're slowly getting better at making the, the the connections um i know one of the the changes that i made is to actually do the hide self view so i have no idea what you're all seeing of, of me which is its own kind of level of stress though i'm not recommending it because i'm always wondering like you know am i drooling or something and everybody can see or something so yeah, it's, it's weird the way we're having to adjust our behavior with this. Um, I, you mentioned, you know, you were kind of surprised by all this. And, and I guess, um, again, for, for people that may not be familiar with the books, uh, I'm going to quote another reviewer from Locus Mag, Adrian Martini. Um, for the uninitiated, Birderbot is a part organic, part inorganic machine originally designed to do exactly what it says on the tin, Birderbot. However, has, has hacked the governor unit and gone rogue by choosing who their client will be. And uh, over the series of books that make up the Murderbot Diaries, Murderbot has been learning how to be, I love this description, how to be a part of a human team and exist in a society that is at best uncomfortable with it. <laughs> and I read that and I thought, I know so many people who could use that last sentence that they are trying to live in a society and work with a team that is at best uncomfortable with them in whatever thing it is. And um, I think, I wonder if that might be part of why the popularity is there, is there? Because it resonates on so many levels with, with um, so many people. Yeah, I think it's because Murderbot in, is very specific about what it feels. Um, it's very specific about its depression and anxiety and how it affects it and um, what it goes through um what it's angry about um what it wants to do and i think really think the more specific um specifically characters express their emotions the more people can find to identify with and because i we know for a long time especially in media there's this belief that uh characters have to be very gen very general to the point of almost being generic like you know generic white guy <laughs> uh who is the hero kind of thing and um and it's really um, people, I think a lot of people identify with that character because they don't, you know, you're not offered any options. Um, but when the more specific a character is about um, their issues, their problems, what they feel, the easier it is for more people to identify with them because you see things in common. And I think part of it's that because, um, and I just put, and I just put a lot of myself on that page. Uh, I was wrote it in 2016. I was really angry. I was really stressed out. And um, when I get angry and stressed out, sometimes I hit this real peak where I get really funny. I'm very bitter, <laughs> very bitter and sarcastic, but also really funny. And so that's really what I kind of poured into that character. And um, 
<laughs> and it appealed to people for some reason. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the, the book design is always beautiful, and especially, I think, you know, it was in the sarcasm font. So, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> um, do you feel like uh, your perspective of your of the world changes as you are able to kind of spill out those emotions and and that thing that appeals to so many? My perspective of the fictional world, or of that I'm creating, or of the real world. The real world. Okay. Um. I don't know. I'm, I'm 57 years old. So my, my perspective of the world has always been pretty dim. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I've dealt with anxiety and depression. So I really don't think it did change that much. I think that um, for maybe for the first time, I expressed a lot of it on the page. Um, you know, a lot of my characters have borderline anxiety issues and I've actually been mocked for that uh, but this was I think this is where I really kind of just um, pulled away a bit of a filter and um, expressed a lot more of my genuine frustration and put and, and put that into the character I, I kind of developed a character where that would would that would work and make sense and um, I don't I feel like that's probably what a lot of people are responding to. Now that in the fantasy of having lasers in your arms that you can deal with people. That you can just, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, also, I think one thing is Murderbot is vulnerable and um, very relatable because of its vulnerability and because of its openness, at least to um, that its openness on the page. But it's also um, someone who can very well protect itself and the people, its friends, people it loves. And I think that also appeals to a lot of people, yeah. especially in very uncertain times. Yeah, I mean, so we're kind of circling a lot around the, the story without actually saying the story. Um, what do you, what would these books be about? How would you describe them, say, to the people who just got back from the Mars mission isolation testing bubble? <laughs> it's, a, it's for future science fiction, and it's about um, a construct, which is a part human or part human, part organic, part inorganic, um, very like a cyborg um, that's been turned into a security unit and in this society, this, this particular uh, area that it lives in, the corporation rim, uh, it has basically no personhood. It's enslaved as a security unit. It has a governor module in its head that keeps it, that forces it to obey orders, punishes it if it doesn't do exactly what they say, what it's, what's a, what it's ordered to by the other, by the security systems and hub systems that it works with. And um, after a certain point, it managed to hack its governor module. And the perception in this world is that if a sec unit um, were to, uh, when a sec unit hacks its, its governor module, it's called a rogue unit, it would go rogue, it would run around and mass murder everybody it could catch, uh, it would be a terrible thing. And what this unit does is when it hacks its governor module, it doesn't know what to do. It basically keeps doing its job it's able to get onto uh, their version of the internet where there's a lot of, uh, like just like ours, where there's a lot of media content and shows and movies and things to watch and things to read. And and it's basically entertaining itself, which it's never been able to do in its, in, in its life before. And really kind of using this media to, uh, for context, for what it's feeling, for kind of exploring its feelings. And then in the first novella, All Systems Read, it runs into, it's it's basically been rented out to a group of scientists who are doing testing on this world. And it realizes to protect them from what's threatening them, it's going to have to reveal the fact that it um, that it's free. It has, it has hacked its governor module. And that's the first novella and the rest follows on from that. But, um, so yeah, it's kind of a robot slave narrative uh, in a lot of ways. 
Um, it can be vi very violent. Uh, it can also be very funny. And um, a lot of people seem to like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it, it occurs to me that, you know, you mentioned that, that some of this came out of your own anxiety and anger. Um, and uh, I mean, deciding that you're going to write, use writing to do that is kind of like hacking your own governor module right there. Um, yeah, that's an interesting way to put it, yeah. Uh, has it helped, uh, you know, at being able to put this out on the page? Um, I think it really did. Um, because it was, it's you know, it's been a hard four years for a lot of people. And then we capped it off with a global spanning pandemic. pandemic so um, it did help me to have that outlet. And I've had people, a lot of people uh, tell me that it was their comfort read which people who haven't read the books think that's really strange. It's like, why is, you know, <laughs> why is a murderous robot your comfort read? It's like, well, <laughs> it's hard to explain. But, um, and actually when All Systems Red first came out, it got labeled by some places as robot horror, which is funny. Um, I remember that, yeah. I remember seeing that yeah. label as that. <laughs> Just yeah. really weird. And I think that was partly because they, I wish I had a copy of the first book, but the way they did the cover of the first book um, you just see Murderbot in the armor with the visor down and opaque, which is a view that the humans in the story have of Murderbot, this very forbidding, frightening figure. And as soon as you open the page, it's in the first per open the book, it's in the first page, it's in the first person, and you're in Murderbot's head, and you can't ever be afraid of Murderbot again. Um, so I think that was very deliberate, but for some people just looked at the cover and said, oh, it's Robot Horror. Uh, it's about, you know, robots killing people and murder and which it kind of is but not not like that not in a bad way yeah i mean that that what we need to do is just we, we need to make a murder bot plushie you know yes. so that we could have those things. how many um, times have you heard the mantra don't judge a book by its cover and it's literally what's labeling your books yeah. oh my god um you know, speaking of the covers, uh, I mean, they're they're really good. They they remind me of some of the science fiction art that I loved as a as a kid growing up. Only they're they're more modern. Um, and uh, I was wondering, like, it, it's been the same artist for all of the the books, right? Um, Jamie Jones. We we have yeah. the the link actually will be coming into the um, site here. And uh, actually, I'm stealing Zay's question here because Zay is the painter <laughs> among us. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, Zay, I'll let you take it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we've had a couple authors on here with some pretty distinct, like, artwork. Um, and, you know, to me, Murder Bot is kind of that. It's painterly. It's got, like, a bit more beauty and intention than some of the, you know, some kind of very basic author works. Um, but... It, what was like that what was the process like for you did you have like control over the imagery i'm just curious what your relationship was with the artist no um i've actually never talked to him um um uh, tour.com is run by irene gallo who is uh, i think is still basically the creative director um art director for tour and um her, their covers are all just beautiful. Um, I think they really, they're really they really distinct. Of, you know, they're all different artists, but their cover art and their design, the design was by Christine Fulzer. Um, it's just gorgeous. And I didn't have any, I didn't have anything to do with it at all. <laughs> um, I've had, I did have some um, cover, a little bit of cover con consultation for my last two Rexura books, The Edge of Worlds and The Harbors of the Sun. And I really wanted that. And then I got it and I had the editor basically came up, found the artist who was Yukari Maisuki and the, who just did a beautiful job. So um, I'm not an art director myself. So I'm really glad that I don't have any, any um, control <laughs> over things like that because it's a really specific job and I just don't know how to do it. Um, I think what they picked for it, his, his art is absolutely gorgeous. And uh, it just really fits uh, fits the books and the characters. 
and it was interesting one thing they did is um when i wrote the first one it was originally going to be a sad short story and then um, i realized it needed to be longer so i made it a novella and then when tour.com bought it um they asked for a second novella and um I started writing artificial condition but the cover for artificial condition was done before the the book was turned in <clears throat> i just gave them usually what they'll do is they'll ask you for if there's a, any kind of um, you know scenes that stand out you know and you'll copy out the scenes from what you're working on and send to them so they can give it to the artist to, to kind of give them an idea of what to do and so he'd done a picture of um uh, murder bot in art i think and he also but he had Murderbot still in um, the armor, which Murderbot isn't wearing after all systems are read. And, you know, I think the editor emailed me and, and we were kind of thinking about it. And he's like, well, we didn't realize Murderbot was not going to be in the armor at this point, but then it kind of fits. And so Murderbot is always shown as in the armor, even like on Fugitive Telemetry, that cover, I don't know how well y'all can see it, where it's not wearing the armor inside the space station. So. But that's kind of a neat conceit. It doesn't exactly match what's going on in the books, but it really matches the um, the feel of the story, I think. Yeah, so what's that like for you kind of getting that back and seeing the artwork for the first time? It's very exciting and to see your artwork, when it, especially when it's really great artwork. And actually what had happened is they had, I hadn't seen it yet, and I don't remember why I hadn't seen it, but they released a teaser of the um, the tour.com books that were going to be coming out that year. And there was a little tea and it was, uh, it was basically like little uh, sli slivers, can't, I can't say S's, slivers of the covers in, in a row for different books. And I could see one that looked like the top of a helmet with a ring and the planet, it, but they're on in all systems. Red has a ring system. And, and I was, I was like, oh, that's mine. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> it's mine. Um, and then when I saw it, it was just like very exciting. It's like, this is perfect. This is a perfect cover. So That's such an odd way to be exposed to the book over yeah. the first time. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, again, it's like I wasn't worried because um, 4.com, again, has some of the, the most beautiful artwork and, and most fitting for this, for the, um, um, for the stories um, artwork. So I was excited. I wasn't worried. I was very excited to see what, you know, what mine was going to be and what it was going to look like. And... Yeah, there's also a lot of great uh, fan art out there. Um, yeah. I want to especially give a shout out to uh, um, Mar. Um, we have a, a link to um, a particular, uh, I'm trying to feel, yeah, it, the a video. We can't play it here because a, it has spoilers, and B, it has uh, popular music that would get our Twitch channel shut down. Um, but it is really fun, um, and uh, I think um, we also have some uh, links to the Tumblr uh, and art account, Twitter accounts of Mar uh, that has more of them in there. And I think that one of the things that really resonates is that um, you also uh, very deliberately do not gender uh, the, the robot, the murder bot, which in some ways makes it possible for any of us to consider being a murder bot because, you know, you don't know what was what was put in there before. Um, and uh, in, in some ways, uh, <laughs> when I was reading this, I was saying that murder bot reminds me of the Vulcans in Star Trek if Vulcans were Vulcaner. <laughs> um, like murder bot is the Vulcanist Vulcan. Um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, instead of being, in, instead of just pretending to not have emotions, Murderbot is just annoyed by, them, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, yes, I have emotions. It, it's really, really annoying. The, the best quote I found there from your, on Goodreads, all the quotes from thing was emotions, ugh, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, definitely have, have felt a lot. Um, and actually, could you, could you read the, that um, excerpt from the thing? So we need to uh, read the the front cover broke. Yeah, there. the front cover from the new one. Yeah, it's not really an excerpt. It's the um, um, right. The, the book description. Right. Because no, I didn't kill the dead human. If I had, I wouldn't dump the body in the station mall. When Murderbot discovers a dead body on Preservation Station, it knows it is going to have to assist station security to determine who the body is, was, how they were killed, 
That should be relatively straightforward, at least. And why? Because apparently that matters to a lot of people. Who knew? Yes, the unthinkable is about to happen. Murderbot must voluntarily speak to humans again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's Fugitive Telemetry, the one that's coming out. Right. And the, there's also um, actually a Dr. Mensa short story that's now on Tor.com. That's free on Tor.com. Um, it's just a little short story from Dr. Mensa's perspective. Uh, and it's set after the end of exit strategy and before the beginning of fugitive telemetry and then network effect. Fugitive telemetry is set before network effect if people didn't realize. Yeah, we actually have a, a link to that coming up uh, in our notes. It's uh, habitat range niche territory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, uh, and actually that, that falls right into a question that was asked in the, the chat, um, which was, let me find it here. Uh, Krimshot said, I've always wondered if Murderbot's exploration of depression or anxiety grew out of it being in the first person, and was it ever not in first person? And, and this particular story is from Dr. Mensa's perspective. And I, I gotta say, I was, when I read it, I was like, oh, now we're getting to see something that Murderbot doesn't really have, which is sort of post-traumatic stress uh, issues. And and so, uh, can you talk about like, I, I don't remember uh, if in other if the previous books if there was ever not a first person in there. I mean, did you when did you decide to change the perspectives? Um, well, one thing, Murderbot lives in PTSD, so mm. it's it's. Um, Probably Murderbot wouldn't understand what not having PTSD was like. Uh, but um, yeah, no, it was first person from the beginning and there's no other perspectives in the rest of the series until Network Effect where you do see um, um, basically 3's perspective and then Murderbot 2.0's perspective. Um, until you've read the book, that's not going to make a lot of sense. But um, when I, and I don't, um, I haven't written a lot in first person before All Systems Red. I think maybe there was one story um, I had published before um, a long time ago um, in first person before this. Um, this character, it just, I don't know, when I first got the idea, um, for some reason, I think I tried when I'm when I'm first trying to write something, trying to start something. The voice is the most important, and um, so I was picking out trying to get this voice, and then suddenly it became really obvious to me that it just had to be first person. And I don't like plan a lot of stuff out. I don't, um, you know, have any, you know. I don't like look at themes and what I'm doing. And I just like, I this, I want this character. I want to write this character. I'm going to start talking in this character's voice. What does that sound like on the page? And um, that's how Murderbot developed. And just thinking about what this kind of person, what their life would be like and what um, the society that would put them in this position would be like that's what everything kind of grew out of. Um, and uh, first person just kind of fell naturally because again, the contrast, like I was talking earlier, the contrast between what Murderbot looks like on the inside and what its head, what's inside its head, that's first person is the best way to get that across. Um, what was the question? Did I, did I, I have a bad, I'll start talking and then forget what the question was. So uh, I, no, it was just, it was just about the, um, the perspective change. Like you brought in Dr. Oh, yeah. Mensa's perspective. Oh yeah. The, um, the new one. I, when I was writing the short story, I actually started trying to write, um, a little, I forget why I want, we wanted to do the short story. Um, I think it was maybe, I think originally it was going to be on tour.com in maybe in 2019. And then they decided to make it a pre-order. Um, bonus. And then now we're <laughs> finally getting it on tour.com. But um, I started trying to write something from Murderbot's perspective and it just wasn't working. And um, I can't remember why I decided to do it from Dr. Mintz's perspective. But as soon as I started doing it from that perspective, it just worked. And, um, and it just came together very quickly, like within uh, a few days. And I'm actually, I'm not a very fast writer. So that's kind of unusual for me. I, I will tell everyone you should go read the short story because there's a subplot of um, 
subtexts that literally subtexts that come in throughout the thing that just made me absolutely giggle um, in terms of the messages that the murder bot is sending Dr. Mensa. So that was that was a lot of fun. Um, the uh, <laughs> I, I, I was looking, there's so many great quotes from this and um, the one the one that came out, I was looking for one that would kind of express uh, Murderbot's opinion of human behavior and intelligence. And uh, there's a lot to pick from, uh, but the one that I picked was from Exit Strategy, which is, but they were humans. Who knows why they did anything? <laughs> and and kind of like Zay was asking about the, the view of the world, considering the way that you've seen humanity handle the pandemic and the election, um, do you think that would be even beyond what Murderbot would expect or or but was it surprising to you or does that kind of just fit in what you expected? It was I don't know I feel like it was shocking but not surprising and I think that Murderbot would probably I think I when I was writing Murderbot I thought it was exaggerating about you know people running and doing stupid things because it does exaggerate a lot um, and now I'm not sure anymore maybe people would just run through <laughs> the monster's mouth I don't know <laughs> I mean, that seems to be uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, you also, uh, we someone in chat brought up, speaking of short stories, that after the, after the last time we interviewed you, someone brought up the one you wrote for Wired, uh, The Future of Work Compulsory. Um, and uh, I was just, you know, kind of like Zay was saying, the, the, um, the future of work, I mean, does, there, there seems to be a little more humanity, people acknowledging humanity because if they're working from home, they have to acknowledge that there's pets and there's kids and there's, you know, houses and things like that. I mean, is that is that changing the way you imagine the, the, the future or, or given new ideas from that? I think it's, um, I, I mean, I know people have said that they think that a lot of companies will continue to let people work from home and, um, I hope they do that because it does solve a lot of problems for people, you know, um, in some cases it's very stressful. I know. So, if, you know, especially, uh, for childcare, um, but then some people it's really working for, uh, my husband's been working from home. Uh, he's had to go back in, uh, into the office recently, but he'd been working from home most of last year. And, um, you know, it was just, it, it worked out really well for us. Um, I think I what the thing I would really like is that um, if our society was kinder to people who are in essential jobs that we actually need to survive like anybody in any kind of food service and um, you know the, the the whole food chain between the people who pick up who pick the the crops and getting that into the store and the people who are our medical people who are in, have to work in pharmacies and all that all the people that just kind of make everything work and yet often are treated so badly um the way delivery food delivery people are treated often like they have that i didn't even think this was i you know i i come up with terrible things in my books all the time and i didn't know this is about the people that would Put a big tip on their grocery delivery order or their food delivery order to you know so it would get there quickly and then take the tip away and it's like that how would a thing? You, why would that's a thing that's horrible i yeah. never oh, even heard of that I yeah know. i oh saw gosh. that on twitter and then um in some uh, other places it's just like why would you there's a special you know, hell for them wow. special hell yeah exactly yeah. so i wish that we could we could evolve into a society that would recognize people whose jobs are, um, you know, dangerous and essential and particularly in this pandemic and um, make their lives easier. <laughs> Your reward for doing something like that should be not to worry about, you know, your money or your education or your medical care. Um, I really wish that could happen. Um, that story in Wired, it's part of a whole series they did on basically the future of work. And um, there was a review of mine somewhere of compulsory and someone saying, well, haven't these people ever heard of unions? <laughs> it's like, 
Haven't we in America ever heard of unions? Because sometimes it doesn't seem that way. Uh, it's kind of ironic after the last Amazon thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's quite ironic. Um, so yeah, the fact that, that, I don't know, somebody would say that with a straight face, it just seems really, um, yeah. So, that's yeah. <laughs> a fair answer. I mean, well, so, you know, here we kind of talk about geeks doing good a lot and maybe making changes that we can to the gloomy perspective of things, which I agree with and are true. <laughs> um, but it's like, uh, you know, I feel like you've you've been a supporter of, of world builders for quite a while. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what does geeks doing good look like to you or what what do you think it should look like? Um, well, I, I'm, the big thing it seems like it's possible to do is, is raising money for different causes. Um, just, you know, the big ones, the sort of world organizations um, and the little small ones. I see a lot of that on Twitter where somebody has a GoFundMe. And if you can really get that in GoFundMe in the eyes of enough people, you can... Um, you can at least fix that problem. It's like, and, and I know they'll understand the whole thing of people shouldn't have to do these for their basic problems. You shouldn't be forced into a situation where you need to beg up the strangers online for money in order to, you know, feed your kids or pay the doctor or save your pet or, you know, save your home, um, that kind of stuff. So, but the fact that this is the situation we're in and wishing it would go away isn't gonna help anybody right now. And the fact that um, fandom's able to organize into these large groups where even if there's nobody who can pay this off immediately for this person, people contributing you know, a few dollars you know, and passing it on is able to help people. Um, but I, I think that's the thing I see most active in fandom. Uh, that's one of the best things about fandom. Um, fandom has a lot of problems, you know, we all know, but um, this is one of the things we can really do for good. Um, and so I guess it's just that that, that ability to organize um, all these different interest groups, you know, fandoms based around books and movies and TV shows that are all and you know people are always in more than one you're always you always have more than one interest and you'll know people in different groups and and so there's it's not so much individual groups but this big interconnected web of people and so uh harnessing that power for good is is a really neat thing and it's great that we can do that cool um we are heading towards the end of our time uh, available i would like to uh we normally, at the end of our show, when we're interviewing someone, we have the, what we call lightning round. Um, but we've already done a lightning round with you because you've been here before. So uh, I thought it might be kind of interesting if you can you know, put yourself into the headspace of the uh, murder bot of the sec unit. Um, we do the murder bot lightning round. Okay. So we have some, some questions tailored to that. Um, and uh, Zay, you can go ahead with the first one. <laughs> I'd like a... a tag that we did warn Martha of this before we did yes. the show. <laughs> <laughs> My brain's going to work. Sometimes it will work, but you yeah. know, hopefully, hopefully it'll happen. Okay, but feel free to skip whichever ones that aren't working for you, but what would your energy source of choice be? <laughs> Probably arts, arts on board um, uh, uh, drivetrain. I, I guessed that one. I got that one right. <laughs> I was I was sorry when I was imagining like what would it be? I bet you something on art. Yeah, cool. Pay attention, guys. This is going to be um, a trivia question. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would what would be your um, your favorite armor or weapon of choice? A drone. Actually, a lot of drones. <laughs> like several okay. several hundred drones. <laughs> Two for two. <laughs> I know I came up with this question like imagining how you'd answer them. <laughs> um what uh early 21st century serial drama of choice. <laughs> yeah, there was a break in the thing. Oh early 21st century serial drama of choice. 
That's a hard one. Um, Are there any that like come to mind right yeah, off the, the bat? The one Sanctuary Moon is based on is uh, How to Get Away with Murder. And it's basically ah, okay. How to Get Away with Murder in space with, on a space call, far future space colony. Um, huh. So you'd have all this soap opera drama. You know, basically you'd have a lot of, you know, action with being attacked by raiders and, and things going wrong and having to be repaired in these desperate situations and natural disasters being interrupted by these really extreme soap opera drama. That's what seems like. <laughs> Gotcha. Well, that, that follows up to the next question, which is, what is your favorite moment or character in Sanctuary Moon? Probably... Um, the colony solicitor, um, <laughs> one who had the clone baby. Um, that's yep. murder. That's definitely murder. That's favorite character. <laughs> Your head's a. Um, what? What's a non-functional item that you carry around with you for no discernible reason aside from humans? <laughs> a bag. <laughs> just a bag. A bag. Yeah. Sometimes it does put things in its bag, but most of the time it's just it's just there to look like um, it needs. To oh, that's right. Bag. Yeah, because it, it, that way you can blend in. Yes, that's right. I Thank forgot you. about that. <laughs> okay, um, and so here's the last one, which is the magic wand question. Um, I have a magic wand, and if I wave my magic wand, Murderbot can make anyone throughout history, real or imagined, alive or dead, shut the fuck up. Who would it be? <laughs> oh God, I know who I'd pick. Um, um, I'd like to hear both answers, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's so many answers, but the one that sort of comes to the top is Ted Cruz. Ah, um, there you go. Um, Murderbot would probably, I haven't developed these characters yet, but there's probably people in the corporation rim that came up with the whole uh, idea of in your, basically uh, put forward the idea of indentured servitude that um, um, Murderbot would want to shut up. Also, it might it actually, I don't really tie the Murderbot world to our world very much, but if I did, Elon Musk would probably be, be another uh, choice that Murderbot <laughs> would, like to, would like to shut up. <laughs> Perfect. That was a more fun, uh, more fun thing than I thought. Um, well, thanks, Martha. We really appreciate that. Um, and <laughs> that I may have to do. We may have to do more like character lightning rounds with people. That's that's kind of fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, real quick, uh, before we we go into our close, I want to acknowledge because I, I saw her in the uh, in the chat. Um, we got this in the mail recently. It's a beautiful little envelope. And uh, inside, there's it. My, apparently, bees is going to be the theme for today. And then to make it really magical, oh neat! There is actually a bee yeah. popped up. That's Ember so and Talir, uh, thank you so much for your card and and the the thing here that we got. It's it is things like this that really make uh, make make our day. Especially, uh, I came back to the office now. You may see now, and uh, you know. Honestly, I thought it would be fun and happy to come back here, but um, since there's just me and one person off in the warehouse, it's like, well, I feel like I'm even more isolated. <laughs> so, um, I'm isolated away from your home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I'm, I'm isolated from home and uh, in my office with the door closed because we can't be breathing the same air yet. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a little rough, but thank you, Amber and Delir. That was awesome. Uh, Saucefire, you can come play in the warehouse anytime you want. He just said in the in the in the uh, chat. <laughs> Saucefire is definitely welcome. Our door is always open. Cool. So uh, I guess it's time to do the tune in next week thing. Um, we say you want to talk about what's coming up. Yeah, in a week we have um, some world builders, fantasy writers coming on, uh, and um, we'll have. Uh, the next week after that, so in two weeks, uh, uh, Heather Slutsky uh, from the Virtual Joko Cruise will be coming on. Um, might also have another special guest with uh, them, so join in for that. Uh, Greg, you want to take it away? Sure. Um, we do have, we're, we're lining up people uh, right and left uh, to come in and 
talk about various things. We have a lot of cosplayers that are going to be coming in as we build up to the Geeks Doing Good fundraiser um, and, and several others. But if you have someone that you'd like to suggest, please do let us know. Um, we're like, he's looking for gamers, developers, authors, of course, artists, or just people who are geeky. Um, we, we just enjoy uh, having people who are very enthusiastic about their subjects and love to share their enthusiasm. Um, and just let us know by commenting or tagging us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or as A says, email questions at worldbuilders.org. Oh, Bast and Cider, you missed so much. <laughs> Have to watch the, uh, the replay. Go ahead, Zay. Yeah, and um, just one more time, thank you so much, uh, Martha, for coming on. You guys can join us here every week uh, at noon on Tuesdays. And this week's sign off is Viva Bot. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Martha. See you later. Oh, and there it is. There it is. <laughs>